This is Relationship Radio, an extension of Marriage Helper International. Hosted by renowned marriage and relationship expert Dr. Joe Beam and CEO of Marriage Helper, Kimberly Beam Holmes. We answer your questions directly with research-based principles that you can implement immediately. Regardless of the situation, what we teach will not only make your relationships better, but will also help you to become the best version of yourself along the way. Don't forget to like, subscribe and click the bell to turn on notifications. Turn up the volume and prepare to take notes as we begin this week's episode of Relationship Radio. Madly in love. That's what we're talking about. We did last week and we're doing this week and we should be doing it next week. At least that's our plan. You say, what do you mean madly in love? Well, there's actually a phrase we use for it. It's called limerence. And we're going to be talking about the middle phase or the second phase of limerence today. Now, it's really interesting as to what occurs there. So if you are, quote, madly in love with someone else or... Unfortunately, if you're in a relationship, say like a marriage, and your spouse is madly in love with somebody else, you really want to hear what we have to say today. So yesterday, or not yesterday, but last week, rather, we started this conversation, this topic, deep dive, so to say, into these three different phases of limerence because people go crazy wanting to know everything they can about limerence because when they find out that their husband or their wife is in love with someone else, they're involved with someone else, they're looking for answers. They're looking for peace. They're looking for solutions. They're looking for, well, I guess, you know, there's just this part of us as humans who we want to know why. Yeah, I think so. And particularly since Freud, not that I've been alive since Freud, <laughs> but particularly since Freud, where that Freud looked into the psyche and said, this is probably why this person does this and this person does that. And then it kind of over time filtered into everything, into novels, yeah. television shows, movies. And so we've gotten to the point where people want to know why, and they think that we always know why. Well, we don't. But, but when it comes to limerence, this feeling of being, quote, madly in love, end quote, we can give you some principles that are applicable and help you to understand some things about it. Now, as we enter into this, please hear this well. If your spouse or the person that you're in love with is in limerence with someone else and you start hearing this information, you're going to want to go to him or her and say, let me tell you what's going on with you. You're not really in love. It's limerence. And, and then you'll start trying to explain limerence. Please don't do that. Because if you do, it's going to work against you. First of all, you'll convince them that it's not limerence. Therefore, if they get to work with somebody like us, who really can help them understand what's going on, uh, we won't be able to because they'll be so prejudiced against it because they're defending themselves against you. And secondly, the fact that even though we're going to explain it in much greater detail today, will not make you an expert on it. There's so many different nuances of it. So please learn if it's about you. Please learn if it's about your spouse. Please learn. But don't try to teach the other person this at this point, because that's probably going to work against you. Yes. I hope more than anything that what people take away from this podcast, if you're listening to it later or this show, if you're watching it live, is what they can do for them when their mm -hmm. spouse is in limerence. Right. And it's helpful to understand what your spouse is going through. But as Joe said, not just for you to teach them or you to shove it in their face or you to try and stop them. All those kinds of things are going to backfire. But simply, most of all, as a way to say, I'm not alone. Exactly. You'll understand that the situation may appear to be unique, and in, in some sense it is, in that mm -hmm. everybody is different. Right. But the general principles here are applicable across the board. They happen to a lot of people. They sure do. They sure do. So in brief summary, what happened last week? If people are just now joining for the first time, last week we talked about stage one of limerence, which we call the infatuation, infatuation stage. Uh -huh. That's right. So again, if we think of limerence as this journey that someone goes on or kind of like a roller coaster, then this infatuation is the first part that leads to the build up, so to say, mm -hmm. of these feelings um, where they're going in and out of having feelings, wondering if they should or shouldn't be doing this, mm -hmm. feeling guilty, not feeling guilty, but it's these strong feelings that keep pulling them back to this other person. That's correct. 
And to some degree, in that relationship with the other person, they are finding some kind of uh, approval, uh, even a validation of self-worth, if you will. And, and they find themselves anxious about the attachment to the other person. What I mean by that is they have this keen, deep, deep longing for emotional reciprocation. I want you to feel the intense emotions toward me that I feel toward you. It's a longing for possession, if you'll allow me to use that phrase, meaning I, I really want it just to be the two of us against the world. And at least a hyper vigilance, which is I'm now watching everything he or she does. And anytime I see anything that I think is a sign for this in reality or my perception, if I see a sign that he or she's reciprocating, yes, you feel toward me like I feel for you. We have this deep, strong, emotional connection with each other. I tend to go into ecstasy, emotions that are amazing. And if through my hypervigilance, I begin to think of you as pulling away from me, whether you really are, or I'm just perceiving that you are, I can go into these depths of depression, like, oh my goodness, I, you can't leave me. You don't understand how strong this need is for you in my life. I love you with all of my heart. I want you to love me back. And all that's happening in this first phase we call the infatuation phase. And what Kimberly was referring to is if I'm married, for example, and I'm falling into this with another person, often I'll try to pull out. But because of the fact we're being so open and transparent and vulnerable with each other, me as the limerent, if you'll let me use that phrase, and he or she as the limerent object, I'll just call that the LO at this point, if you will, then he or she knows how to pull me back, not because they're wicked or evil, I don't mean that, but because they have such a strong emotional connection to me. And so it's kind of three steps forward, two steps back, it wiggles. It's not a straight line as I'm going in through this infatuation stage. And somewhere toward the end of the infatuation stage, I go into a thing called crystallization. That's the phrase that we have given to it. Crystallization, and some things are gonna start happening toward the end of this first phase, infatuation, and definitely into the second phase, crystallization. And that's what we'll talk about today. Yes, this crystallization phase. And as Joe alluded to last week as well, is that if you have found out that your husband or your wife is having an affair, then this is typically the point where you find it out. Is that often, correct? That's often the case. Not always, but often the case. Mm -hmm. So in this phase, what what is it? Define what it is. Okay. Now, in this particular phase, understand that if, if you're the person who is married to someone who has gone into a limerick relationship with another, then it's for you to understand. But we know that X number of people who are watching this are actually feeling this themselves right now and maybe trying to understand more about their own emotions, why they feel what they feel, how they feel it, etc. Now, in this stage, it's like, okay, the infatuation stage was three steps forward, two steps back, and and maybe I shouldn't be in this, but it feels so good because I want this emotional connection with the other person. And in the crystallization phase, I believe that he or she is responding. In other words, he or she has the emotional connection with me that I want. Now, it doesn't do away with the hypervigilance. What I mean by that is I'm still super sensitive. Hypervigilant is the word I use. Super sensitive to any signs of... Um, reciprocity. In other words, he or she really does love me like I love him or her. And any sign of potential rejection, like, oh my goodness, he or she's pulling away. And so some of the characteristics here, and let's just kind of talk about these. I'll throw a bunch of them out and then you got us back through which ones okay. to talk about. Would be a, a strong sense of uh, jealousy. Like, I, I don't want you to have any relationship with anybody else that I think might be threatening to our relationship. So mm -hmm. that becomes these people become very possessive, very jealous. It's also um, the point that I begin to think, wow, I don't know if I could actually exist without you. Because this thing is so strong, it's so powerful, that I'm thinking, I, I, I have to have you for my life because I've never felt this way about anyone before. And then if you're in a relationship with somebody else, say, like you're married to a husband or wife, um, then you can do some of the following kinds of things. Now, not everybody does all of these, but I'll mention them very quickly. One is vilification. Mm -hmm. Vilify is a fancy way of saying I make a villain out of. And so if I'm in limerence with Sally Sue and I'm married to Alice, then most people in crystallization, not everybody, but most, will then begin to... Um, exacerbate whatever flaws and weaknesses exist in Alice. Mm -hmm. I'm vilifying her. I, I no longer am thinking about anything good about her. It's only, my mind's only seeing things that justifies my leaving her. 
I'll then go into a halo effect, which is started over toward the end of phase one, a halo effect toward the LO, my lover, where that I cannot see any flaws in him or her. Mm -hmm. It's like, because I feel positive about him or her, everything about him or her is positive. And if I'm forced to see some of the flaws in that person, I minimize them. Like uh, I, other people think that's a big deal. I know that it's not. And then often, if like if you're in a relationship with somebody else, you start um, rewriting history. So if I'm in limerence with Sally Sue and I'm married to Alice, I'll begin to, in my mind, rewrite my history with Alice. Now, not because I'm consciously doing this. This all happened in kind of back here. And what's happening to me is that my mind actually gets to the point where it can only remember things about Alice where she is flawed. And every human being is flawed. And those get exacerbated. And my mind actually stops remembering any of the positive emotions I felt toward her. Mm. So if somebody were to ask me, uh, well, when you first fell in love with Alice, I'd go, oh, I've never been in love with Alice. Even if there was documentation, even if I wrote love songs to her. It will be, no, I've never been in love with Alice because my mind actually rewrites that history and I can't remember good things about him or her. Well, there are more of the things instead. Uh, well, not instead. There are the things in addition to those, but that kind of gets us started in understanding. Oh, and the last thing, you're still doing this. <laughs> You'll go between ecstasy and misery, ecstasy and misery. And that's based on the fact when you think he or she's reciprocating your deep emotional connection, then you're in heaven, and when you think he or she's pulling away, whether that's in reality or perception, it's miserable, like, oh my goodness. And sometimes you'll actually see physical manifestations, like chest pains, uh, rapid heartbeat, um, anxiety, depression, all kinds of things that happen when I feel like the other person's pulling away that go just the opposite when I feel like he or she is responding to me like, this, this is amazing, nobody's ever felt like this. Mm. Now, I threw out a whole bunch of stuff in a hurry there. So how would we like to address those things? Well, from a lot of what you said, it sounds like many of them can be summed as the mind is powerful mm -hmm. and it's going to take the path that leads you to feeling not guilty about this. Mm -hmm. So the rewriting history, the um, exacerbating the things about your spouse that you like or you don't, you know, you the things like. you don't mm -hmm. like and mm -hmm. minimizing maybe the things you do like, all mm -hmm. of that kind of stuff is it's kind of like the mind's way of coping. Exactly. Because if, if your belief and value system is, say you're married, I'm, say I'm married to Alice. Mm -hmm. My belief and value system is you don't cheat on your wife. You don't do all these. And, but now I'm involved with Sally Sue where I am cheating on my wife. Mm -hmm. Well, the first thing people typically do is call compartmentalized thinking. What that means is, I don't let those two things touch each other. And, and as long as I can not think about them both at the same time, I don't mm -hmm. feel a particular amount of guilt. But you can't keep them apart forever. And so when finally they come into conflict with each other, this is my belief in value, and this is what I'm doing in contradiction to my belief in value, you go into this thing called cognitive dissonance. Cognitive means it's happening up here. Dissonance means disharmony. I'm miserable. Hmm. And so your brain, it's not a conscious thing of, hmm, I think I will exacerbate the flaws in my spouse so I feel better about myself. That's not it. Or I think I'll exacerbate the good things about my lover so that he or she, in comparison to my spouse, there's no comparison at all. This person is like my soulmate, this amazing person. These are not things that people sit down and plan out. It's not a strategy that's done consciously. As you just said, it's basically my brain trying to protect me from feeling mm -hmm. such cognitive dissonance, disharmony. In other words, this is miserable for me, mm -hmm. and my brain's trying to get away out of the misery, mm -hmm. and there's only two ways to do this. Yeah. Either I stop doing the things in contradiction to my belief and value system and go back to it, mm -hmm. or I modify my belief and value system to make this okay. Mm -hmm. Each way, whichever one I do, is trying to get me out of that misery of trying to decide between the two. Hmm. So we at Marriage Helper know limerence. And so when we see a couple that comes to us and this is what's going on, we can identify this pretty quickly. I'm going to throw you a curveball. Oh, curve. I love curves. <laughs> you when throw I, when I played baseball, I could never hit a curve. <laughs> so let's, let's see where this goes. We'll see where this goes. Okay. So 
in because I'm just trying to think of another type of situation. So many people, when their marriage is in a despair like this, they typically go to a counselor. Mm -hmm. If a counselor who didn't know about limerence was to see a couple at this state right now, what do you think that assessment of it would be? What do you think the counselor's assessment of it would be? And what do you think they would typically say to a couple in this kind of situation? Well, if we're going to base it off of what we hear from people Mm -hmm. and not just one or two, but person after person after person after person after person. Most counselors and therapists have never been trained about limerence whatsoever. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, I'm often invited, often may be wrong, occasionally invited at least, uh, to come to different counseling centers where they have like 10, 15, 20, 25, even 30 counselors working out of a center and to teach them about this thing called limerence. And it's kind of amazing to me when I go do that, that those counselors will have earned their degrees at different universities. They didn't all go to the same school. Like one went over here, one went over there, one went over there, one went over there, all around America. And yet none of them have heard of this thing called limerence. As a matter of fact, I even had one counselor say to me, well, I don't think it really exists. And I go, have you looked at the research? I mean, There's tons of research out there about this. It actually does exist, and it is an identifiable kind of love. It's an identifiable emotion, and we can identify it because it has several characteristics, and we say, oh, that's what's going on here. We can even identify about how long it's going to last uh, based on some good research that's out there about that. Now, individuals might change a little bit, but you understand that. So what we hear well, you tell them what we hear. What do they tell us? The counsel- what do people tell us? Their counselors said in these situations. Probably my favorite one. Favorite. My favorite was the counselor who said, "Well, y- since your spouse is in love with someone else, that's who they're meant to be with, and therefore you, the wife, are now the other woman, and you." shouldn't be trying to save this marriage because you're breaking up this relationship <laughs> you're breaking up it is the i mean that is the craziest thing i've ever heard yeah so uh, maybe favorite is the wrong word to use here right maybe the one i that, didn't love that it happened <laughs> no but the craziest absolutely the one that makes thing. you the angriest the ones you right you go how in the world Insane. But the reason I'm asking the question is because most people, that's their first line of defense. If this is what's happening in their marriage, they're going to a counselor. And so what I'm wanting people to glean from our conversation is the limerence may have been what's going on or may be what's going on in your marriage, but a professional may not see it that way. This is why it's important to know these symptoms, these signs, what to look for, and most of all, to know that it doesn't mean that you've lost hope. There's still always hope for your marriage. But just because someone might look at that and say, well, it looks like your wife is happier with this other person. Therefore, you don't need to break that up. Yeah, I think that's one of the most ridiculous things we've ever heard. Yet, just a couple of days ago, one of our client reps said that this couple had already signed up, enrolled for one of our three-day intensive workshops, and then called back to our client rep and said, well, our counselor said we shouldn't go because it's obvious my husband's in love with this other woman. Therefore, there's no hope. I should just accept it and move on with my life. Now, you might be saying, well, wouldn't that be true? I mean, isn't he going to go be with that other woman if he's madly in love with her right now? He might, but that's not likely what's going to happen. You say, what do you mean? Well, the second phase finally comes into a third phase we'll talk about next week. Limerence, that intense feeling of love for this other person, is not going to last a lifetime. As a matter of fact, it's not going to last years and years and years. Most of the people that I have seen and worked with, it hasn't lasted as much as three years. By the end of the third year, it's pretty well over. Now, we could tell you all the research behind that, and if Kimberly wants to ask questions about it, we will. But uh, if you think about it, it's a biological necessity that it ends. In other words, it's built into us for survival because that intense level of emotion toward another person is extremely detrimental to productivity. Now, think back when most people weren't having jobs in offices. Think about the human race, that that we're primarily hunters, gatherers. We're agrarians, which means that we're growing crops here, there, and everywhere. And when productivity stops with people that have to actually bring the meat back for the table or or the crops in for us to eat or to can those crops so we can eat them later in the wintertime, et cetera, et cetera. If if there's a great big lack of productivity when culture is, society is dependent upon that, the society begins to die. 
In other words, people begin to die because we don't have enough to feed everybody. So if you look at it from that standpoint, it's a biological necessity that it ends. It's built into us. And, and people don't have that level of intense emotion where that for the rest of their lives, they're hypervigilant. So that anytime it appears that you're reciprocating, I'm in heaven, it's ecstasy. And anytime you appear to pull away from me, I'm in absolute misery, even having chest pains or anxiety or other manifestations when they do that. That can't last a lifetime because that's untenable. If, if it started and then stayed like that for the rest of their lives, people would go crazy. You can't live like that forever. And the productivity goes to zilch, zip at some point. Therefore, it has to end. It always has to end. Mm-hmm. And if a marriage counselor were to say, well, no, your husband's madly in love with her. Therefore, you're the other woman now, wife, and you need to get out and let them be happy then this counselor obviously has no understanding of the fact that that intense level of connection is not going to last. Mm-hmm. And what we point out to people is this. You, you're making a decision thinking you're going to feel this ecstasy right. when even right now you're not feeling that ecstasy every day. You're feeling that ecstasy when your hypervigilance says the other person's responding positively. You're feeling misery when you think he or she's not reciprocating. You already experienced that. So um, if you think that you're going to finally just get to ecstasy and stay at ecstasy for the rest of your life, it's not happening now. It won't happen in the future. It's going to be like this until finally it goes like this. And so we tell people, you're making decisions about your future Mm -hmm. based on an emotion that you feel sporadically right now Mm -hmm. that you think you're going to feel that for the rest of your life. Think about it this way. And this is what we often say to people. Before you make a life changing decision, Mm -hmm. like I'm going to divorce you and marry you. Before you make a life changing decision, ask yourself this question. What would my life be like if this person goes away? Now, if you're thinking, oh no, he or she never will go away. They'll be here forever. I understand how you feel. So first let's start this way. Let's say, God forbid, they're in a plane that goes down. I hope that doesn't happen to anybody ever again in history, but let's just say they they die unexpectedly and you've made a life decision, changing your relationship with your current spouse, changing your relationship with your children. You say, well, I still have a great relationship with my children. If you're not living with them, you don't have the same relationship you had before. Mm. Admit that. You really don't have exactly the same situation you had before. You have changed it. And so if you start changing these relationships with spouse, children, friends, church, whatever you're part of, to be with this person and he or she goes away, Are you going to be happy with the decisions that you've made? Now, even though you likely do not believe what I'm about to say, this is going to end. It always does. It always does. I mean, the research is ample. It's out there. At some point, it's going to go away. Now, it's still going to be like this. It's never just like zoom, zoom, zoom. It's still going to be up and down and back and forth and those kinds of things. But it's not going to be the same that it is right now. It's not. And, and that's when often these people don't wind up marrying each other. Mm-hmm. It's because one or maybe both, but at least one, starts looking around going, look at all I've given up for you. Mm-hmm. Look, look for all those things I had I no longer have because of you. And in that situation then, it's like, wow, I made this decision and, and I, don't, I don't have what I thought I was going to have from this. So therefore, the question is, before you make a life-changing decision because of what you're feeling right now, Ask yourself the question, what will my life be like if I make that decision and he or she goes away? So couldn't you say, though, especially someone who's in this phase of limerence, couldn't they say, well, yeah, but that's the same thing I did when I chose to get married. I made a lifetime decision based on how I felt at the moment, Mm -hmm. which is now where I am. Mm -hmm. So couldn't they use that same logic to say, just like you're saying I shouldn't be making this decision now, what if I wasn't supposed to make that decision then? I'm not saying they're not supposed to make the decision. I'm saying they have to make the decision. Mm-hmm. All right. If if a person, and not every couple that gets married goes through limerence. Mm-hmm. Many do. Many don't. They actually develop a relationship that never goes through the limerence phase. But let's say when you got married the first time, you were two single people and you went through limerence and you wound up married to each other. You see what happens when you get into this deterioration phase, and we'll really talk more about that next week. But when you get into that deterioration phase is when you start counting what you've given up to be with this person. Now, if you were two single people and you really didn't give up anything other than your singlehood, mm-hmm. 
then most people aren't looking back going, oh, my goodness, I can't believe all I gave up for you. Some do, Mm -hmm. but the majority do not. In this situation, I'm married to this person. I'm married to Alice. I get involved with Sally Sue. I divorce Alice to be with Sally Sue. Sally Sue then has some things that she loses to be involved with me. Let's say she divorces her husband to be with me. Or let's say that Sally Sue was single, but now she loses relationships with people that matter to her because they're not happy with the fact that she Mm -hmm. took she took me away from my wife, that kind of thing. In other words, in a relationship where that one or both are married or in a committed relationship to the other, then there's always damage. Mm -hmm. Always damage to other relationships. Mm -hmm. That's why these people tend to pull away from each other. It's like, look what you cost me. Mm -hmm. Could two single people, could one of them do that? Actually, we see that sometimes. Look what you cost me. But in this situation, almost all of them do. Mm -hmm. It's like when it starts deteriorating, it's like, I don't feel this intensity anymore. I don't don't experience this ecstasy anymore. I'm not feeling that. Mm -hmm. And, And now I'm thinking about, what I've given up, what I've lost to be with you. And that's why the majority of them never get married. Hmm. If I divorce this one for that one because of limerence, the likelihood is I'm not going to marry that one at all. Right. And if I do, well, first of all, second marriages already have a divorce rate of uh, two thirds, two out of three. First marriage is one out of two. Second marriage is two out of three. So already, statistically, the odds against me, uh, third marriage is three out of four, interestingly. But this one actually goes higher than two out of three. It's because um, I'm, these thoughts I had about you with this halo effect, where I thought you were absolutely amazing and had little to no flaws, I now see those flaws. Yeah. And everybody is flawed. And I'm also counting the cost of what it costs me. And that's why even if they do marry, which is pretty rare, if they do marry, the likelihood of divorce is extremely high. Yeah. And we'll talk about that more next week as next well. Week. Mm-hmm. But in this phase, so we call it crystallization. And because really during this phase, you're crystal, the person who's in it is crystallizing, hardening their feelings for this person. They're looking for what's going to lead them down the path towards getting with the person, being with the person, and they're going to get rid of everything in their life, holding them back from being with that person. Very good way to say that. Because in the first phase, they still vacillate. Maybe I shouldn't. Maybe I should. Maybe I shouldn't. We can't clearly delineate, boom, boom, that's when it entered phase two. But somewhere around here where they start going to phase two, that's exactly what's happening. That's a very good description of that. And so what they're chasing, like you're saying, is this ecstasy. It's this feeling, which part of me wants to say, isn't that the problem with society today? But really, if you look back in history, we always chase our feelings. Yeah, but I think there have been times in history where that... uh, culture itself had expectations of you do the right thing, Mm -hmm. even when your emotions are against that. Mm -hmm. And so people would figure out how to fix things. Mm -hmm. For example, even today, countries that have arranged marriages where people don't don't do the dating and picking out which one I'm going to marry and that kind of stuff. The family picks who you're going to marry and they try to pick somebody they think fits, et cetera, et cetera. The divorce rate's nearly zero. I mean, it's very low, not not zero, but it's much, much, much lower yeah. in those countries than ours because they marry with the whole idea of yep. we're going to learn how to be in love with each other. We're going to learn how to make this a good relationship. Whereas when you drive it mostly or almost all together on emotions, mm. which is what we do in America, mm-hmm. emotions change. Yep. And when they change, you go, oh, my goodness, this is not working. I don't think I'm going to stay with it. So I do mm-hmm. think in history we have reached a time well, we started actually about 50 years ago, maybe more than that. It was the 1960s. That's 40, 50, 58 years ago <laughs> that it began to change in this country. It's like all about what I feel right now. Mm-hmm. And without stopping to think, but I'm not going to feel tomorrow. It may, may not feel tomorrow what I feel today. And I'm certainly not going to feel the exact same things five years from now. So either feelings deepen, mm-hmm. not ecstasy, but deepen or they fade. Mm-hmm. And and limerence is not about deepening, it's about ecstasy. Right. And this goes, it definitely applies here to limerence, and that's what we're talking about. But no matter what the situation is in your marriage, you're going to have days where you feel in love, days where you feel excited, ready to do this, and days where you don't. And so it's this thought. So even if you're the spouse who's married to the one in limerence, 
you're going to have feelings of wanting to make it work, wanting to do everything to save it. And then other days feeling like it's a loss, like it's hopeless. Like, why would you yeah. stand for this? Yeah, you get on an emotional roller coaster too. That's right. You That's do. a good point. That's excellent. You absolutely do. But the point of all of this, even as we're talking about the spouse in crystallization and the spouse who's hopefully standing for the marriage, is that ultimately you need to choose to not lead. You, you need to choose to not let your feelings lead you, but to you lead your feelings. Yeah, as much as is humanly possible. Right. Absolutely. But as you know, still some days you're on that. Mm-hmm. But you're, that's a very good point, Kimberly, that for the spouse yeah. that's standing for his or her marriage, they're going to do that as well. Mm-hmm. Similar in some sense to, to limerence, but not definitely not limerence, in that when you think your spouse is responding positively to you, mm-hmm. you go up here. And when you think that, that he or she's pulling further away from you, you go down here. Yeah. I haven't really thought about that in those, in those terms before, but that's exactly right. Yeah. So how do you be that constant? How can you be consistent when your spouse's emotions are everywhere, your emotions are everywhere, you're wanting to make this work, your spouse is doing everything to villainize you, to hate you. I mean, what can you do? Yeah, I can say really mean things to you, all those kinds of things. Yeah. I think it's probably almost impossible to do by yourself mm. because of the fact, well, I mean, some people are that strong and they can, mm-hmm. and, and I admire the ones who can do that, but most people aren't that strong. Unfortunately, most of the help that people get are from people that give them very bad advice. Mm-hmm. So it might be your friends and family saying, you just need a divorce, this idiot, move on with your life, be free of him, be free of her, because you deserve to be happy, and this person is scum. And that's why we regularly tell people, mm, probably not a good idea <laughs> to listen to your friends and family. It's not because they're bad people, but because they love you so much, they're going to give you bad advice because they're mad at this person who hurt you. Mm-hmm. So it's better to listen to professionals. But then it's the second thing. It needs to be a professional who... Uh, understands what we're talking yeah. about because the wrong professional will actually hasten the ending of your marriage. Right. Like you just need to give up or don't you just need to accept the fact that he or she feels what he or she feels. Mm. We would agree with that. You need to accept what he or she feels or what he or she feels, but that does not necessarily mean that you need to give up because those feelings at some point will change. So yeah. even the wrong professional is going to do damage and lead to the ending of your marriage. We've said many times, really good marriage counselors are worth their weight in gold. We love them. Mm-hmm. And there's some as we actually send people to if, if those people live in the area where those counselors are. The ones that don't understand this and say, well, we just need to do what makes both of you happy right now, do more damage than good. And, and, if, and if they don't agree with that, I'd love to have one come on the radio. Or, or, we're not doing radio, are you? Come on. <laughs> Come on Facebook Live and actually debate us about that. We'd be happy to do that. You understand that none of this is just clean and easy. None of it is. This is all complicated. But people like us, for example, and forgive me if this sounds like a commercial, but the people that work with us are all, okay, we understand how you feel. Many of the people who lead, for example, our intensive workshop for marriages in, in trouble have actually been through this, have actually experienced it. So they understand it, not just the social science and psychology behind it, but they live through it, mm. one of which is me. And other people that work with us have had marriage problems and difficulties. And we look at it and go, yeah, you might wind up divorced, but we can show you how to do the things. And if you're in this emotional state where you're doing this, no, I'm talking about the spouse standing for the marriage, doing this, mm-hmm. then having some calm guide mm. who can say, you calm down. Yep. <laughs> this is the thing you do next. This is the thing you do next. We cannot guarantee. We will not guarantee it'll save your marriage. Those people on the internet that guarantee they can save your marriage are liars. We do not guarantee it will save your marriage, but we'll tell you that if anything works, this will. If anything works, this will. And, and our success rate is three out of four couples. So we know that it really does work. Now, if you don't want to do work with us, that's fine. You find the people that you want to. It's your choice. But it's got to be somebody who understands this and can guide you on how to be calm and what you do next and who understands your spouse and what it is he or she's feeling. Or, or if you're watching right now saying, wait a minute, but I'm the one in limerence. I'm trying to understand me. I would extremely uh, encourage you come to one of our three-day intensives because in all likelihood, the person leading the workshop has been right where you are and knows exactly what you're feeling because he or she has felt it. And if you ever want to be in a place where that somebody understands you, not going to be judgmental, not going to be condemning, but understands you, and at the same time teaching some really good principles, then that's what you'll hear from our folks. 
Mm, that's absolutely right. You know, Joe, I think one of the hardest things for the spouse standing during this phase of crystallization is being calm. Yeah, sure. It's hard to do. It's so hard to do. Even from being calm as in they've left. I was just talking with someone this past week, about a week ago, who um, she contacted me and she said, he he's leaving right now. He's leaving right now. What am I supposed to do? And my only response and guidance back to her was, there's nothing you can do right now. In this moment, there's absolutely nothing you can do that's going to make him stay. Right. And that's okay. Mm-hmm. Because you have, right now, the only thing you can do is be strong, be calm, be gentle. Don't try and bar the door. Don't try and stand in front of it. Don't grab his heels as he's running out. <laughs> I don't think he was running, but (laughs) don't don't do any of that. But now you have time. This is where the real work starts of working on your pies. Like we teach over and over being that strong person, you're going to have other opportunities to interact with him. Mm -hmm. It doesn't all have to happen today. Right. It's when you think you've got to fix it all in the moment that you tend to do dumb things. You can't do it. Yeah. It's got to be a longer picture, a longer view. Mm-hmm. Not just what's happening at the moment, but a longer view. Now, understand this. Um, sometimes you'll say, but wait a minute. Now his or her limerent affair is over, and he or she still hasn't come back home. Well, we yeah. don't have time to talk about that today, but we can help you understand why. There's a general principle I'll put in front of you, and we'll talk more about it in future programs, which is this. People don't leave what they have unless They believe what they're going to is better. People Mm -hmm. don't leave what they have unless they believe what they're going to is better. Now, if he or she is leaving you for that other person, it's because in their minds, the relationship with the other person is better. I know that hurts, but that's what they're thinking or feeling at the moment. And when that ends, they may have so vilified you and so rewritten history Mm -hmm. that when that other relationship ends, they're not immediately coming back to you because in their mind, they've worked it out where that you're not the person they should be with. And they may even see being alone as being better than being with you. That's why there's a system that works over time because people have often said, well, if if that other person just got hit by a truck, everything would be wonderful. Mm -hmm. No, no, it's still going to be a process. Even if that other person suddenly dies of a heart attack, Mm -hmm. there's still going to be a process of getting this person back to you. And, yeah. and that's why we look to the long view, the yeah. process. These are the things to do. These are the ways to do them. And understand that if anything works, this will. Yeah. And as we've said, the people that come to our workshops, three out of four of them actually do work it out and eventually get back together. Some, even by the end of the workshop, mm-hmm. some a few weeks later, some a few months later, that kind of thing. Yeah. So even if you think about even this word crystallization, something that has crystallized, I don't know if you've ever had honey that's crystallized in, in the jar. So if you don't, if you don't eat it quick enough, which doesn't typically happen in my house, but it can, <laughs> um, it crystallizes. It kind of starts coming together, and it's hard, and you have to heat it in order to loosen it to get it back to its point. Huh. But if you put all of it in a saucepan and put it all the way on heat all at once to try and make it happen, it burns. Oh, I love that illustration. That's excellent. You have to put it on slow and low and let it simmer and slowly start to melt, which is what we're doing here. I like that. That's very good. It's brilliant. I just thought of it. (laughs) (laughs) I thought it was so good. That's why you had an organization and I don't. You're smarter than I am. This is great. I think of analogies once every three weeks. That's a great one. It's, It's a process. It's a process. They are hard. Yeah. And they're going to do some things that really hurt you because they are hard. But there's a process that can soften them. I like this. But But if if you try to do it too fast, it'll burn. I like it a lot. It'll burn. And while you can still melt, even after it's been burned, it's never going to get that taste out. There's still going to be damage that's been done. Thank you for joining us for this week's episode of Relationship Radio. Please refer to the notes in the description to learn more about any resources mentioned in this episode. Please visit our website at marriagehelper.com for more information about our online courses, marriage workshops, and coaching. If you would like immediate help for your marriage situation, then click on the link on the screen to schedule a free marriage strategy call with one of our team members. We exist to help save marriages and strengthen families. We look forward to interacting with you on the next episode of Relationship Radio.